So, as you can see behind me, our first lecture for the day is called Mastering the Creed, Onboarding the Player in Assassin's Creed Mirage and Valhalla's Dawn of Ragnarok. Uh, onboarding, in this case, suggests uh, we're going to be talking about tutorials, and I guess you'll see more. Just let me adjust this thing. Okay, so this is your presenter. Uh, I was already presented by Alex, so thank you. And uh, yep, yeah, I have been a game journalist. I've worn many other hats throughout my lifetime. And I am currently a senior game designer in Ubisoft Sofia, where I work since 2016. Uh, I also love cats a lot. And while I don't really have the, the pointer, uh, I hope we don't attract many of them because it's going to be chaos. Anyway, today's lecture, first let's go through what a tutorial is, why you use them, do we really need them, a brief history, and then let's see how all of that was applied to uh, both Assassin's Creed Valhalla's expansion, Dawn of Ragnarok, and Assassin's Creed Mirage. <sighs> I really hope we fit in the time. <laughs> okay, so first, what is a tutorial? Uh, the cliche goes, as you know, to usually check in with the Merriam-Webster dictionary. So I've done that, I'm not gonna read it for the very obvious reason that it's not really relevant to what we're going to be talking about. So, I took the liberty of making my own definition that we're going to refer to. And that is, uh, a tutorial is any piece of textual or audiovisual information that we use to teach the player how to play our game. So, let's see how lively the hall is. And uh, I have a question for you all. So show of hands, does Pac-Man have a tutorial? If you think it does, please raise your hand now. Okay, 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 okay. not many hands actually. Thank you. Uh, going by the definition I mentioned earlier, just one slide earlier, yes, it does have a tutorial. And that is it. On the... Arcade Machines Bezel, it has uh, some text information about how to play the game. The question is why? Why does it have it? Isn't it uh, intuitive enough? Isn't it easy to figure it out by yourself? Maybe, but at the time, keep in mind this is 1980, uh, there wasn't another game like that. A lot of people didn't know how to play a game like that, so uh, an instruction such as this one, was pretty much imperative. And this is how games used to explain things back then, mostly through text. Text on an arcade machine, text in a leaflet, text in a manual. When we go to home consoles, then we move on a few generations of consoles, and what we see is uh, starting to teach player through use of level design. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, you might have seen this particular screen of Super Mario Bros. 1 uh, being shown as a master class of teaching the player through level design, and it is. But I'm not going to uh, go through it because time. <laughs> In any case, uh, two generations later, we start seeing more and more ways that games are trying to teach uh, their players how to play them, and button prompts in-game, breaking the fourth wall, as well as uh, NPCs that give you instructions or through dialogue and stuff like that. Things and methods we still use today, by the way. Uh, another generation later, and it's the Wild West. Everyone realizes that manuals are not enough, and maybe we should get a bit more creative with how we teach players. So what happens is we see a lot more text inside games. Uh, we see uh, training levels or tutorial levels 
which are usually at the very beginning of the game and showcase every single game mechanic there is in the game. And that kind of makes the rest of the game feel like it's an exam. Like you've gone through the lecture in the first level and the rest of it, you were being tested if you understood it. Which is something that we're trying to avoid since a generation later. But also, one more thing, very important thing, we start seeing uh, limiting three Cs as a method of teaching the player. And three Cs, do I have to explain what it is? Okay, controls camera character. So in this particular screenshot, we see our main character. He's limited, he cannot move. The only thing that the player can do really at this point is to move the camera because we're trying to teach them how. So using three Cs and limiting three Cs, in this case, is how we teach the player that. Okay, we move on a generation, and this is actually where we kind of stand today because uh, all of those methods I've shown you before, we see them now in every game. I'm using AC2, uh, Assassin's Creed 2 for several reasons, one of which is this. Uh, button prompts, text, images, icons, quest objectives, dialogue, everything tells you how you need to play the game, how you can play the game. And another thing, because all of this happens very gradually through the first two sequences of the uh, Assassin's Creed 2. Well, not only are the characters and the world and the main conflict introduced narratively, but also all the core game mechanics that the player needs to acquire and master, which are movement and parkour, stealth, uh, social stealth, combat, and so on. And those first two sequences and that gradual introduction of uh, core mechanics through gameplay and through narrative, that's what we're going to call onboarding. And this is why I'm showing it to you. Whew. Okay, uh, so far so good. And then the question is always, when you make a game, what do we tutorialize? Because if we show everything and if we teach the player constantly and if we constantly tell them what to do and where to go, they call it a hand-holding. So we need to be a bit more uh, careful with what we do. So, those are my three main points. Those are mine, my own, but I share it to you all and you can use them. So, what do we tutorialize? First and foremost, controls. Why controls? If the players cannot uh, control your game and don't know how to interact with it, that's not okay. Second, uh, core mechanics. Core mechanics are pretty much every feature, every way of interacting with the game that the player needs to acquire, master, and know to be able to finish the game. And finally, exotics or exotic gameplay. That's everything that's too far removed from the core features and might happen once in the game or maybe later in it and so on. Or maybe we change the rules instead of uh, running forward, we run towards the screen, stuff like that. And there is another method. It's not something I came up with. It's very um, commonly used in video games and in industry in general. You may find it in different, uh, named in different ways. But this is what I want to show you because we're going to have a lot of examples later. So uh, this is the teach test trial method, as I call it, or 3T. And basically, this is uh, a good way to introduce core mechanics, especially. So, what is teach? We show the player what to do, or how to do it, or we tell them, or we guide, it, uh, guide them through it, and we teach them. In a safe environment, what is a safe environment, you might ask? It's a situation where the player is not in any uh, fatal danger and they can make mistakes without having to go back to, uh, too far back. Then, we test. 
first with each, then we test. The test can come immediately after, it can come a bit later, but ideally it should be a very similar situation to the teach uh, setup. So the player can recognize what they need to do, how, and apply how to do it based on what we've taught them already. So this is the teach, uh, the, the test moment. And finally, and this could be a bit later, but ideally not too far into the game, trial. Uh, make sure that the player has understood the mechanic, how to interact with the game, what we've taught them, what we've tested, in a kind of different situation. So they can apply what they've learned. It's like uh, mathematical equations, you know. Okay, uh, before we finish with this introductory section, I want you to focus on these takeaways. If you don't um, remember anything else from it, those are the three things that I kind of want you to take away from this. So, games always had tutorials in one way or another. A piece of text could be enough, it had that. Uh, tutorializing what is needed, when is needed, is ideal and gradual onboarding is way better than just having a tutorial or training level in the beginning, especially if your game is longer or more complex. Uh, teach test trial for core feature is a good cheat, if you will, or a good method to, to achieve that, to achieve the gradual tutorialization and make sure that players will uh, memorize and uh, apply what they've learned better. And now we go to the meat of the presentation. Uh, as one would say, tutorializing Assassin's Creed Valhalla Dawn of Ragnarok. So in this section, particular section, I'm going to talk about uh, this expansion, the third one of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which is the Viking iteration of Assassin's Creed. Uh, Ubisoft Sofia had the pleasure of collaborating with Ubisoft Montreal and a lot of other studios on Valhalla, and we also uh, developed as a lead studio expansion, uh, this expansion, Dawn of Ragnarok. So, how many of you have played Dawn of Ragnarok? Okay. <laughs> I see some hands, so I think I need to recap a little bit what happens in that game. So I'll try to keep it short <laughs> in the interest of time, but basically in Dawn of Ragnarok, you play as Odin, the Norse god Odin. And you help the dwarves of the world of Svartalfheim, which are being invaded by the fire giant, this fire giant, uh, Surtur and his army of fire and ice giants, we call Muspel and Jotnars. And uh, the main mechanic and the main thing that makes Dawn of Ragnarok stand out is that dwarf, the dwarves give you a bracer, we call the Hugger Rip, which allows you to take the powers of those giants, uh, of Surtur's uh, army, and apply them. And those powers are usually magical stuff like uh, walking on lava and uh, freezing time, flying as a raven and stuff like that. So this is the important part. You'll see why it's important a little bit later. Now, uh, as I said, when we start making a game, first thing we need to establish what do we need to tutorialize. And when working on Dawn of Ragnarok, we did just that. We had a feature list and eventually we did a short list of the most uh, important features that are, in this case, core features for the expansion, but for Valhalla they're kind of exotic in a way. So those are them. Odin powers, Dwarven shelters, Milner rates and upgrade weapon, collectibles or activities are secondary. Then, there was another wrinkle because uh, Dawn of Ragnarok was meant to be experienced in different ways. You could play it as an expansion to the main game. You can start from your settlement in England or you can play it as a standalone without ever going back to England and uh, starting it from the main menu. The thing here is that we needed to accommodate both of those scenarios 
uh, to make sure that players eventually reach Gift to the God, which is our actual onboarding, uh, with the same knowledge or at least on similar level of understanding. And this was very important, accommodating those two types of players. Uh, as you can see in the rescue, which is the dream sequence that happens and that introduces the story, there are no tutorials, but we did scale uh, everything to the player's level to make sure, again, that there is this level of difference is not, uh, not that significant. Why no tutorials? Why? Why did we decide on no tutorials? Well, Assassin's Creed Valhalla had the benefit of having the codex. And the codex is a menu which um, houses every single tutorial that the player has seen and also information about the world, the characters, and uh, historical facts. So in this case, uh, instead of repeating the base movement and base combat and base controls tutorials, we had uh, a message that just referred players to the codex in case they wanted to review them, if they already played Valhalla or learn about them in this case. Uh, so accommodating many types of players. So how did we approach this <laughs> as developers? Now, uh, it was a two-pronged approach and it has one word uh, that is very, very important for both sides, which is collaboration. So on one hand, we had uh, live documents and uh, that documentation was used not only as design, uh, one spot for design, but also for making changes, making requests, um, tracking implementation, stuff like that. And this was one side of the thing, but the other was collaboration with quest and level designers to make sure that everything we want to teach the player, especially during the onboarding, is sequenced properly and is supported by uh, cutscenes, by the narrative, by the level design. You'll see how, I hope, in a little bit. But before we do that, there's two more points. Uh, one of them is to know what we had to work with because I'm going to be using some terminology and uh, I really need to introduce that terminology to you. So <laughs> this mockup has four UI, user interface modules, uh, which are the most commonly used to relay information to the player. So one of them, contextual controls, we're going to call them contextual controls. They could be button prompts, action prompts, whatever you work, want, but for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to call them contextual controls. Those will show the player how to control the game. And uh, they can be static on the screen, as you can see here, or they can be attached to pretty much any object in the world. Their use and why we use them, I think I don't have to explain. Uh, this is the second thing, critical message. We use this traditionally for warnings and error messages, but also when we want the player to do something right now, because it could be um, essential to teaching them, it could be essential to their well health uh, or enjoyment of the game, and uh, you can usually see stuff like uh, your health is low, press, press this button to heal. And this, as you can understand, is pretty important because we show it when their health is critical. Now this, uh, this is an AFS message. AFS means Animus Feedback System. Uh, and it's called like that because in universe, in the Assassin's Creed games, those messages are usually written by whoever is the Animus operator, which is why in the present day segments, you usually don't see those. Uh, they can have an image if we want, if we decide that we need to illustrate what's been taught or told, uh, but they can just uh, be a block of text. In any case, uh, those are used for brief, very brief messages that explain basics uh, or to remind players how to use something or to give them a suggestion. That's it. They stay on screen however long we like. The default is seven seconds. And in the case of Mirage, we actually um, measured the text and how long should it stay to be comfortably read. 
Finally, we have the post panel behind me, and uh, that is something we use very sparingly because it poses the game. And posing the game is something we try to avoid because it kind of breaks the flow. And uh, if it happens in a very um, tense situation, like maybe fighting a boss or something, it could be frustrating. So we try to avoid them as much as we can, but we use them um, usually when we have to explain or introduce something that's a bit more complicated, that needs a video, because we, we can have a video file here, um, or to prevent player errors, because sometimes in Valhalla, for example, when your stamina runs out for the first time, you get this, uh, because you need to know what happened and how to recuperate from that. So, again, to reiterate, contextual controls, critical messages, AFS, and post panels. We'll see them a lot in a little bit. Okay. And now, uh, that section of Dawn of Ragnarok, that onboarding uh, scheme that I showed you earlier, all of that takes an hour. And that mission that I called onboarding, Gift to the God, takes about half an hour. That's for context. And we'll go, we're going to go through that mission a little quick to show you uh, what we did and why we did it. Okay, so the story here is that stuff happened and the dwarves, two dwarves find us and promise us a gift. And we're going through a cave and uh, they're leading us to that gift. So what we see first is uh, a Muspel giant looking for something, maybe the gift, maybe not. And we have to kill them for the dwarves to proceed. After that happens, uh, they give us the gift and that is the aforementioned Hugger Rip Bracer. And then we have to teach the player how to use it, right? So because that is used to take powers away from um, enemies and from Muspel and Jotnar giants in particular, this is what we did. So we have a critical message, we have a contextual control. That's very clear, the critical message does not disappear until the player does the action or goes a little bit away because we don't want to be that obnoxious. Um, when they do, when they do the action, what happens is we have a special version of the post panel that cannot be disabled or closed or canceled. As you can see, that explains what the power is and what its utilities are as well as this specific UI um, element that makes you, as a player, have to choose which slot of the available uh, ones on the hooker rip you assign the power to. So there is player action involved. The, the, the players cannot just skip this step. They have to take conscious action. <sighs> then, because we need to teach, now that we have the tool, uh, we do it through level design, and not only. But uh, it's a bit dark, for which I apologize, but this is the teaching moment. So the power we just got is Power of Muspelheim. And Power of Muspelheim allows you to become a Muspel giant for a little bit, um, for a time, and walk on lava. And that's its main utility. So to teach that, we have this, the following scenario. So we have the two dwarves here at a locked door. And then we have uh, a crevice the player can go through and should go through, which is lit up, as you can see, with daylight. Uh, and in this case, the player must go through the lava, through the crevice, and go to the other side and unlock the door. And that's how we teach them how to use the power. But to really hammer it down, um, the dwarves explain all of that to you through dialogue. We also have an objective, uh, which suggests finding another way. And we have a critical message at the right time, which tells you how to activate the power. Now, each power uses this resource we call Hoover. I hope it's <laughs> you can see it, the bar down there. And it's very important to know that Hoover can be gained in three ways. So killing enemies gives you Hoover. Interacting with a specific uh, type of flower, which gathers hunger, gives you hunger, and 
Uh, finally, a shrine, a specific type of shrine lets you sacrifice half of your health and refuse your hunger bar. But this is the resource we use. What do we do, though, if the player has already triggered the power of Mustelheim before we told them to? Well, we have safety. We have this shrine nearby with some healing mushrooms because players need to sacrifice half of their health to use it. And in that way, we kind of give them a little bit of safe environment, at least, well, <laughs> the most you can do in a lava field cave. Then what happens is, okay, we open the door, we get reintroduced to the shrine if we haven't before, and we have the test. We taught the player, now we need to test their understanding of how the power works. So very similar scenario that here is a hole and that is a locked door. So, literally swapping it. Very similar situation. When they do that, we introduce them to second way they can uh, gather hugger, which are the hugger blooms, those flowers I mentioned before. And then we have the trial. And the trial, in this case, is still going through lava to push a boulder so the dwarves can jump over the, uh, the gap. And again, we do that through dialogue, we do that through quest objectives, but still we let the player uh, figure it out for themselves instead of just uh, putting post panels or maybe critical messages on screen. Finally, we exit the cave and the dwarves suggest uh, the second usage of the power of Muspelheim, which is blending in with other Muspels. And we can do that, we can opt to not do that. In any case, this is up to the player. And what we have then is introducing the Muspel Alarms. I'm not gonna go um, too much into that. But basically that's another mechanic that, is, that we deemed to be important because uh, when you go into a location with Muspels, they can trigger an alarm which can spawn reinforcements. And we show uh, in cutscene all of those reinforcements so we know how they look like. And then we need to get to the Dwarven Shelter. So Dwarven Shelters are a curious <laughs> mechanic because they're essentially where Dwarves hit after Surtur invaded. And uh, because they kind of wanted to keep them secret, even from one another, what they have is this um, method of signposting where they are, where the entrance is. And you can see this signpost on this object here, which is a barrel. So this yellow room that points towards the entrance. But that's the thing. The dwarves for us opened the map in this case. And they've given us a rough whereabouts of where the, the, the shelter should be. And also we see where we are. So we get a picture of how big the radius is in which we should look for those rooms that I showed you earlier. And eventually we go to the shelter and we are granted uh, some silica. This is silica and this is the resource we use to upgrade the hook rip. Uh, and to make sure that the players know what they use it for, we point them with an objective to the nearest blacksmith. That's the blacksmith right there. And we have a post panel which explains how to gather more silica. With all that done, we have title review. We have this big Assassin's Creed Valhalla Dawn of Ragnarok, epic music. It's awesome. If you haven't experienced it, please do. And uh, then we unleash the player in the world. And that's it. Uh, we leave them to discover all the rest of the features and powers by themselves and experiment and guide them only when we need to do it. So, before we move on to Mirage, I just want to uh, show you another thing, because I had the pleasure uh, to actually write the texts for these tutorials, both in Dawn of Ragnarok and Mirage. Uh, I'm, I want to share with you something that is brief instructions, in this case, hints in the other case. Uh, you want to go for brief instructions in the case of core mechanics and controls. 
and for hints for secondary things. Now, the takeaways, again, this one. Second, collaborate. Collaboration is a good thing. And uh, you'll see why. And try to accommodate many, many types of players as much as you can. In this case, we had with Don of Ragnarok the two ways you can experience the expansion. So, expedition to Baghdad is how the next part is called. <sighs> and uh, now, after Dawn of Ragnarok, we had the pleasure of collaborating with Ubisoft Bordeaux on Assassin's Creed Mirage. And Assassin's Creed Mirage is a very particular game because, a uh, very curious game, because it had the mission of going back to the roots of Assassin's Creed and paying tribute to uh, everything that came before. So, how did we achieve that? We worked with Ubisoft Bordeaux and established um, an extension of uh, what we did for Dawn of Ragnarok. And in this case, uh, we had live documentation, 2.0 we called it, which included a bit more uh, wireframes and planning. Also, tutorials and introduction of mechanics and onboarding was uh, included in, part, uh, in planning the quests and the narrative and everything else. <laughs> and finally, eight out of 30 user tests that we did for Assassin's Creed Mirage included um, testing on player understanding of onboarding and tutorials, which was very crucial because it gave us a lot of feedback. So, another thing, uh, we had a lot of inspiration to draw from um, Assassin's Creed games and uh, true history, <laughs> if you will. And you'll see some of that examples later. But, okay, so I told you earlier that the Dawn of Ragnarok onboarding takes 30 minutes to an hour. This here is the onboarding of uh, Mirage, and it takes between two and a half hours and four hours, depending on how you play. It has Basim, our main character, go through, uh, go from a street thief to an established hidden one, as the assassins were called back then. And the only thing I want to show you on this slide is that we have a lot of skill tests, how we call trials then. So, we teach, we test, we trial a lot. And now, this is the final part. <sighs> I really hope we're not too short on time. In any case, uh, here we're going to go through certain parts of the onboarding. So I can show you some neat tricks that we did. First and foremost, when starting the game, the first thing the player needs to do, Basim is a street team here. The first thing the player needs to do is move and follow their childhood friend, Nihal. We don't tell them how to, unless they don't move for five seconds. If they can't figure it out for five seconds, contextual controls. That's it. Accommodating many types of players. Now, moving on, we have the NPC, Nehao in this case, uh, showing us, because monkey see, monkey do is another thing that I recommend, by the way, for teaching the player. If you show them something that they can figure out by themselves, uh, it's also a good way to, to teach a mechanic. And in this case, we have a combination of both this and contextual controls, both on screen and in the world, attached here on the corner. Basim and Nehao reach a market, a crowded market, and because a thief's prerogative is actually poking into people's pockets, uh, we, need to, we need to teach them how to do that. Pickpocketing was a very special uh, case because uh, pickpocketing in Mirage happens through a mini game. A mini game which re uh, requires precise input, so you need to press a button at a certain time. So that's why we had a looping video in the post panel, and that's why we have post panel, which triggers when uh, the player is in range for the pickpocketing action, but not after they've entered it. And that's the mini game. Now, then, because we already showed parkour, then we test the parkour. And this is the test. We only uh, introduce new elements that the player might have not um, seen before, like the zip line, in this case, or the pole vault. Then we get to our employer, the dervish, and uh, we get a new mission to steal a shipping ledger from the docks in Ambar. And uh, 
we make the player safe in a cutscene. As you can see, the Basim is in the bushes. And this is where we're going to teach detection, the basis of stealth. So uh, we got inspired from Origins so what here. And what we did was a very scripted sequence where the guard notices you, but you're still in, um, in the bushes, but not crouched. So you're not really hidden. We have this post panel exactly to prevent detection. And we limit the three Cs in a way that the only button that's active for the player at this time is the crouch button, which you can see behind me. <laughs> and then when the player uh, presses the crouch button, they crouch and the guard, let me see, okay. And the guard uh, goes towards us. And in the minute, in the moment he's starting to detect us, we prevent that by another post panel which again, limiting the three Cs to only the button that needs to be pressed. In this case, uh, assassination or knocking out because Basim is still a street thief. He does not have a weapon. Then in this case, we have a test, an optional test immediately, a, back, uh, a guard turned with his back towards us. We can engage with him. We cannot if we don't want to. Anyway, mission successful, we go back to Dervish and uh, we meet Roshan, who is uh, uh, the, one of the mentors of the Hidden Ones. And then we get the idea of impressing the Hidden Ones by stealing something from the Caliphal Palace. And to make sure, because this is now the trial for both, um, uh, for both parkour and stealth, and seeing what player understood, uh, we have this dialogue option. Uh, Mirage doesn't have a lot of dialogue options, very sparingly. In this case, it's to confirm they understand that we are... Whew. Okay. We've hit time, by the way, almost. Uh, but in any case, we need them to understand that, yeah, no going back. So we test stealth and detection, as mentioned. We introduce some stuff contextually. Mission successful. And then whatever happens, happens. I'm not going to spoil it for you. But uh, Basim needs to run, essentially, from pretty much all the guards in Ambar because of that. And this is the test for uh, how they understood parkour, because they need to get away now. Finally, because detection and stealth is, a, again, not just detection, uh, we have contextual um, critical messages in AFS for when they manage to escape the guard's vision and they stop searching for them to explain what happened. Again, tutorializing what needs to be tutorialized when it needs to be. Then stuff happens, Basim gets recruited into the hidden ones and his training starts. I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time. But then uh, another neat trick when Basim gets his weapons, his dagger and sword, uh, what happens is that the, he also gets a tool, his first tool, the throwing knife, and we have an optional tutorial here, which is cool because what we did here is uh, if you interact with the NPC that needs to, um, that, that teaches you how to throw the throwing knives, we have this AFS which suggests uh, how to equip the tool you just got. And this AFS stays on screen until the player equips their throwing knives. If they equip their torch, for example, it doesn't go away. It requires the throwing knives. We have another test of uh, parkour, and then we teach combat. And combat, uh, pretty simple, by the way. Just contextual controls on screen and uh, tracking what, player, what we teach the players through uh, quest objectives. And then we have the test immediately, during which we show uh, the, all the controls, all the mechanics you learned until now to make sure you understand them and you have a reference if you didn't. Uh, <laughs> and then we return to Baghdad. We have two more mechanics here that I want to go through, and I'll try to do that really quick. But this is where the player is unleashed in uh, the open world, and they have full freedom. Um, but we're still in onboarding. He's not still an assassin yet, right? So 
This is when we trigger the wanted level system or the notoriety system, as we call it in Assassin's Creed. And uh, it's contextual. The first time the player does one of 17 possible actions that are counted as illegal, this shows up telling them, okay, now the guards are gonna be after you. After they reach uh, a certain threshold, this uh, post panel shows up again to make sure that the player isn't killed while we explain it to them. Uh, and this tells them how to decrease their notoriety. Then we have contextual, again contextual, only when we need to tutorialize AFSs for both ways of uh, decreasing notoriety. One is the wanted posters. You can see Basim <laughs> ripping one here. And this is the Munadi, which is uh, who you need to pay for lowering your notoriety, but they lower it all the way down. Finally, we rescue uh, the leader of the Zanch Rebellion from prison. And then the test, if the player, uh, the player must have kind of uh, interacted with the notoriety system until now. But even if they haven't, uh, we show them the post panels now and we uh, point them to uh, both wanted posters and Munadi to make sure they understand how to lower their notoriety. And this is an objective now. They have to engage with it. Finally, this is Basim's first true test, uh, his first target. And I'm not going to spoil what happens and how to approach it, but after he kills the target, we have the final part of the onboarding, which is the assassin's focus. Because Basim himself is not entirely a historical figure. He's a bit supernatural uh, in war. Uh, he has this ability of chain assassinating really fast a number of enemies. And uh, the war explanation of doing that is that the animals cannot render uh, his movements because they're so fast. But how do we show that in game? How do we show his first uh, usage of this ability? Well, we did a lot of going back and forth and we ultimately achieved the sequence I'm going to show you now uh, by listening to players from user tests and listening to feedback and applying that feedback and iterating on it is something that I really want to emphasize for you guys. So, we have a post panel immediately after. Through three Cs, the player can only press the Assassin Focus Trigger button, nothing else. When they do, they enter a special version of uh, the Assassin Focus, which cannot be cancelled, cannot be exited, and they have to mark their two targets that are in front of them. When they do, as you can see, we have a preview of the animation that's going to play and the direction that Basim is going to go. And then we have uh, the assassination itself. And finally, to really make sure that we acknowledge that this is a little bit fantastic, uh, we have Basim being confused about what happened because he himself does not understand it completely. He kind of does by the end of the game. Anywho, uh, those are the takeaways from this particular section that I kind of want to impart to you. So, when in doubt, feedback, listen to feedback. Player feedback, if you can do, do user tests. Peer feedback, give it to someone who uh, hasn't worked on it, to play it, to give you honest feedback. Listen, just listen, don't tell them they're playing it wrong. That's very important when gathering feedback. Uh, and then react to player actions and inactions when possible. This is a continuation of accommodating different types of players. So as you can saw, uh, as you saw, we give them the freedom and we only show uh, tutorials when we have to. Contextualizing via narrative and better immersion is my message because uh, when you contextualize stuff, like what we did in Mirage was having Basim as a street thief, he doesn't have weapons. Why doesn't he have weapons? Because he's a, he's a street thief. Then uh, we gradually introduce mechanics through narrative and through level design and through tutorials and stuff and, um, and gameplay situations. So this helps immersion. Do it when you can. Whew!
looking at the time. <laughs> so we have time for a couple of questions. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and I am going to give you a mic. You can ask it, and then uh, Diane will answer it. Hands? Anyone? Ooh, there's a question there. I have a All question right. there. Da. That was adrenaline-inducing. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Uh, my question is, when is too much inform... Uh, how do you avoid giving too much information to the player uh, with all these uh, pop-ups on the screen? Uh, for ex I'm giving you an example uh, in Dead Space, the original. Mm -hmm. um, the game, first of all, gives you a diegetic um, tutorial with how you should deal with enemies. You should dismember them and it shows you that you should cut off their limbs with uh, bloody... Uh, yeah, bloody that's side. done through mostly visual language and, yeah. uh, and um, writing on the wall and stuff like that. It's a little bit more immersive as I know what you're uh, referring yeah. to. Mm -hmm. uh, but later in the game, actually, it, um, sh uh, it gives you a prompt with the in-game UI. It pops up telling you you can dismember enemies and later a character also mentions it. Do you think that is, um, do you think that is because many players missed the first signs of how you should deal with enemies, or is it a case of uh, too much babying the, the player? I don't believe in babying. I'm sorry, but uh, well, the three team method suggests that okay, we teach, we test, we trial. In the case of that space, maybe uh, showing the player instead of telling them is the teach, but they make sure that the player understood when it's really necessary. So this com um, kind of combines both the test and the teach moment. And then we get the trial, as you know. <laughs> I'm not going to talk, go into details for that space, but I believe that having a secondary way to make sure that the player understood the mechanic is always good. I don't think it's babying. There are many types of players and you need to accommodate as much as you can. Because, yeah, that's that's my stance. Thank you. Thank All right. You. And other questions? Do we have? Just one uh, more question. Okay. I know, Bobby, I see you. One more question. I'm, I'm really responsible sorry, for this. <laughs> for not leaving you too much time for that. Hi, and thank you for this great talk. Um, thank you. So my question is, since uh, players nowadays tend to not have too much time to play and tend to forget mechanics, for example, if they don't play the game for a month, mm -hmm. do you believe we need tutorials to uh, reinforce uh, if, if we detect that the player is not behaving correctly or forgot the controls or forgot the mechanics? Do you believe this could be a possible future where games actually show you tutorials again in such a situation? in certain situations? Um, we do reminders in Assassin's Creed games for very uh, important features, uh, but that's situational. What we do have, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and that's why we chose to not have uh, basic controls in Dawn of Ragnarok, Sintro, uh, is we have the Codex, and the Codex is a page, a place where, a menu, actually, when you can reference everything, every control. So. If you haven't played the game for two months, three months, a year, and you have forgotten how to control it or how something works, you can refer to the codex. Maybe having a suggestion, if we detect that, uh, to the player that, okay, you can refer or reference the codex if you forgot how to play. Maybe that's a good idea, actually. <laughs> but it's, again, accommodating many times of players. Best thing you can do. <laughs> All right, round of applause for Jan Karolev. Thank you guys.